The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And welcome visitors and church family. We miss seeing you. Thank you for joining us. You know, it's easy to believe that God loves us when things in life are going well, but it is human nature to have a hard time believing that God loves us when we are going through really tough times. But the Bible says, that what can separate us from Christ's love? Can trouble or hardship, can persecution or famine, can nakedness or danger or the sword? And it goes on to say that nothing, absolutely nothing can separate you from how much God loves you. You are so loved right now. Yeah, it's easy to feel like when we're going through these difficult times that maybe God has forgotten us or abandoned us. And it's, it's an easy trap to fall into, but we want you to know not only that God loves you, but we love you here at Shepherd's Grove and at Hour of Power. We want you to know that we're on your side, we're praying for you, we, we haven't forgotten about you. More than anything, though, we just want you to know that we love you and we're so glad you're joining us. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you'd send your Holy Spirit to move in the hearts of everyone under the sound of our voice. We pray for everybody who is fighting this disease in some way or another, fighting the boredom or loneliness, um, fighting the disease itself by you know, wanting to be healthy. We pray for first responders. We pray for everyone who misses family, friends, and work. We pray for people with businesses. Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would bring a sense of grace and peace to us so that we would be able to take this with a type of calm. And I pray for wisdom and favor over everyone under the sound of my voice. And we pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn around and turn to the person next to you or maybe an imaginary friend and say, God loves you and so do I. To inspire you to invest in quiet moments with the Lord, we've created a special package just for you. For five monthly gifts of $30 or a one-time gift of $150, we'll send you the Moments with God tea set and journal. In collaboration with the Hour of Power team, Hannah Schuler has compiled a book featuring her favorite verses on a variety of topics, along with ample room to journal and reflect. We've added a matching tea for one pot and cup, as well as a tin of decaffeinated Fruits of the Spirit tea a gold metal strainer, and a commemorative 50th anniversary Hour of Power teaspoon. The heart behind this one-of-a-kind set is to inspire you to seek God in quiet moments so He can speak to your spirit, illuminate your path, and empower you to live abundantly in Him. Call, write, or go online and request the Moments with God tea set and journal. You are the heart behind everything we do. And as we commemorate our first 50 years on television, we're overwhelmed by the way God has used your prayers and your support to do more than we could have ever asked or imagined through the Hour of Power. Jesus is the hope that anchors our souls and sets us on the path to success and endless possibilities. This is why we must ensure that His Word goes all around the world. I'm praying for you and asking the Lord to lead you into His presence fill you with his Holy Spirit and use the course of your life to inspire, bless, and heal others. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we. Mm -hmm. 
time I've traveled some roads, a rolling stone, no one feels like home. And I see people come and go, but life is just a story of some highs and some lows. Tell me, do you believe in miracles? I'm standing here before you. Preparation for the message, Revelation 2.17. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone and with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Church family, may we know the hope to which has God has called us, to the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Amen.
Pepper Peel is the granddaughter-in-law of the late Norman Vincent and Ruth Peel, founders of the Peel Foundation, which was founded on the idea of positive thinking and how to spiritually grow your faith with positive thinking and actions. The foundation currently helps fund organizations who uphold the same values to what the foundation was based. Please welcome Pepper Peel. Well, welcome, Pepper. We're so glad that you're here with us. What a joy. You know, it's uh, been an, such an interesting time for us. Well, first, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. That hymn was fantastic. Yeah, you know, we, it, this is an interesting time for us as a ministry because this is the 50 year anniversary. And, you know, even being a Schuler, I've always known your grandfather, grandfather in law. I've, I've known. Well, we knew him personally when he was alive, and he was such an important part of our ministry. He had a human, you know, enormous impact on my grandpa personally through his writing, through his mentoring, uh, and then of course the kind of tipping point from our for our church was when he flew out from New York to California to the drive-in church. You know, when my grandpa was in his 30s, and it, you know, and it was just this explosive response of people. You must have some amazing memories about him and about. His message. I, I do, um, because I am an in-law. I married into the family, so I'm I'm one of the lucky people that knew of Norman Vincent Peale before I knew him. Yeah. And so that was really a blessing. And my favorite story is when I was 28, he said to me, "Well, how old are you today?" It was my birthday, and he said, "Oh, you're just getting started." <laughs> And I remember thinking I was very old and very wise. And now when I look back, 28 is really just getting started. It is. Such a positive way to look at the world. And, and he lived that every day. So that's, see, that's one of the things you always wonder, you know, some intellectuals, you know, that are human, humanitarian have the, this, you know, their family will say they didn't really like people. They liked humanity, but they didn't like individuals. But Norma Vincent Peale wasn't that way. He was really a pastor at heart, wasn't he? I felt that way, certainly. Um, I, I felt him, uh, his, his influence, his, his joy. He was, I, I always say about him, that he was interesting and interested. Mm -hmm. And probably those two things fed on one another. I was actually with my grandpa when my grandma told him that Norm Vincent Peale had died. And I remember him weeping and this sad thing on his face. And at the time I was, a, you know, I think I was 11 or something. I didn't totally understand but he was really just devastated by that. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Um, it, he was a, a person who affected people deeply uh, worldwide and, and just a blessing as part of the family to, to know that and to, to raise my children with that, um, that history, that influence is, is, is really wonderful. Well, it's so great that we both too are this th sort of third generation sort of helping carry on the legacy of, of you know, the giants on whom sh whose shoulders we're standing on. What's it like for you to sort of be a part of carrying on Dr. Peel's legacy? And, and do you think that, how has that message sort of evolved for the 21st century? Is it, do you think it's still palatable today in the way it was in his day? Oh, I think it is. I think what what has turned out maybe even more recently in, in the in the recent past is that um, those messages that, that were Con conceived of and, and printed and published and, and distributed worldwide and preached from pulpits um, were timely at the time, but they are timeless. Um, we are still struggling with so much of the same issues and the same demons. Um, and the way to help one another is to help one another and to actually do justice and love kindness and to walk humbly. And, and to do that um, is, is a gift uh, to be able to do that. And that's why, you know, thinking positively is not being Pollyanna. Yeah. It's not uh, not acknowledging the negative. It's actually uh, embracing what, what could be um, and how we can help one another. And that's what I believe that the foundation, the Peel Foundation, um, is really all about. How do you think that your grandfather-in-law and your grandmother-in-law, Ruth, I mean, how do, if they were alive today and they wanted to give some sort of matronly or patronly wisdom to this generation, go, in this time, you think about the pandemic, it's certainly hard to feel positive about anything. I mean, we have no idea what the future holds. It certainly doesn't look good. People are getting sick and now there's politics are getting involved in all of this thing, which I think is really unfortunate. And there's just so many layers to this that, and reasons, just like 101 reasons why people could feel negative about what's going on. What do you think, what do you think they would say? Or what do you think Dr. Peel would say to us right now? I 
hesitate to to speak on his behalf, sure. but I, I like to think that he would say, you know, Jesus told us to love one another as you love yourself. And so those two things um, infer something. One is that you should love yourself. Yeah. Um, you are a gift from God. You were created in an image. Uh, love that. And then turn around and love your neighbor as yourself, as you would want to be treated. Um, I often say to people, it's simple but it isn't easy. Um, and sometimes we have to struggle with being human yeah. and he, being human isn't easy. Um, so give yourself a break, yeah. um, try to look at things better and, and treat someone in a situation, leave it better than you found it. It's easy to be negative and it's hard to be positive. Absolutely. I think, po Absolutely. I think positivity is, takes effort. And, and, it, and it has a reward. And I think that's one thing that we're learning from your ministry and we're so grateful for that. Oh, well, thank you so much. And, and that's why the Peel Foundation feels really strongly about, you know, I, and I think you and I were discussing about, you know, trying to do online ministry and, and yeah. having a, a service when we'd rather be in the in the pews with our friends. We'd rather be together. And but knowing that it's good for other people, yeah. it's a gift. You're, you're, you're doing something wise and loving for somebody else. So the idea for us is to drive people to be on social media and to use a hashtag that we've come up with called Ever Positive. Now that's um, launching this week, trying. isn't it? I, I wanted to talk to you about that. We're really excited yes, about it's this. Actually, it's just starting. We're just starting, and um, the, the hope is that people will, wherever they are on social media, because we're all social distancing, yeah. and we probably have more time on social media, um, to post something positive. Sh shoot a quick video, maybe a meme that you love, a Bible verse, maybe it's just pictures of your kids, whatever it is that's helping you get through a really di difficult time, um, and use the hashtag EverPositive. Um, and the hope is that it will help you, yourself, feel better because you're con concentrating on something positive in your own life. Um, maybe it helps the people that you're commenting around and for, your family, your loved ones. And who knows, it might even affect somebody you don't even know on the other side of the world. Um, Grandpa Peel published more than 40 books um, that are published in all sorts of languages and still being published today. Um, you can download, we have an app that you can hear him preaching from the pulpit at Marble Collegiate Church. Um, with timeless messaging. Um, do that, use this time to use the ever positive hashtag. And, and I, I would invite you to do the same thing, Bobby. We would love to have you, how you and your family are getting through this tough time. It's hard. We have lots of people watching live on YouTube and Facebook, and now would even be a great time to uh, put something out there positive as you're watching the, the service and uh, just type hashtag uh, ever positive. Pepper Peel, thank Absolutely. you so much. We are just so grateful for what you're doing and excited about the future of the, of the Peel Foundation. We know it's in great hands. Thank you so much. And if anybody has questions about the Peel Foundation, they can visit us at peelfoundation.org. We'd welcome anything they'd like to share. Pepper Peel and Peel Foundation Org. That was like a tongue twister, like Peter Piper, you know? <laughs> I know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we're so thankful that, that you were here today. And thank you for reminding us about the importance of staying positive in our thinking and our mindset in this time. I think it's gonna make the difference between victory and failure for so many people. We certainly hope so. And thank you so much for your ministry. All God's blessings on you. Thank you, Pepper. God bless you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. One of the greatest American principles is that under freedom and religion, any boy or girl, no matter what the circumstances, can rise to the stars. That's the great old American principle that's fascinated people for 200 years. So if you haven't succeeded, if you're plodding along, but you don't like what you are, start believing in yourself and believe in Jesus who has the releasing power that nobody ever did possess. Thank you for joining us on Hour of Power today. We hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. The past few months have been challenging for each and every one of us. 
the fear of a new disease that nobody's ever seen before and caused our whole world to spiral into the scary unknown. While it's easy to get caught up in the fear and anxiety caused by the day-to-day -day news reports, we don't have to be afraid. God has given us tools to weather this storm. The Bible is the guidebook that supplies everything we need to maneuver through the seas of life, no matter how hard the waves crash. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. When we spend daily moments dwelling with Jesus and seeking His truth through reading and prayer, He fortifies our faith and equips us to take on greater challenges for His glory. Yeah, when you set aside time every day to pursue God, listening for His voice and embracing His promises, He will meet you and bring supernatural grace and peace to your circumstances. With five monthly gifts of just $30 or a one-time gift of $150, we'll send you the Moments with God tea set and journal. In collaboration with the Hour of Power team, Hannah Schuler has compiled a book that features her favorite verses on a variety of topics, along with ample room to journal and reflect. We've added a matching tea for one pot and cup, as well as a tin of decaffeinated Fruits of the Spirit tea a gold metal strainer, and a commemorative 50th anniversary Hour of Power teaspoon. The heart behind this one-of-a-kind set is to inspire you to seek God in quiet moments so He can speak to your spirit, illuminate your path, and empower you to live abundantly in Him. Regretfully, we have recently learned that due to unforeseen circumstances surrounding the COVID-19 crisis, delivery of the Moments with God tea set will be delayed until August. We sincerely apologize for this inconvenience and humbly ask for your understanding. We will get the product into your hands just as soon as possible. We covet your ongoing support in this unprecedented time. Hannah and I are praying for you and asking the Lord to lead you into His presence, fill you with His Holy Spirit, and use the course of your life to inspire, bless, and heal those around you. Remember always, God loves you, and so do we. The streets are paved with gold. 
Would you stand with me? Hold your hands out like this and say this creed with me. We need to say it now more than ever. Let's say it together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Today we're starting a new series. The new series is God's name for his children. Now, a couple of years ago, we did a series about God's own names. You know, God has over 70 names in the Hebrew Bible. We, I picked out my favorite. But don't forget, God also has names for you. He's got lots of names for you, and they're wonderful names. Like he calls you soldier. He calls you ambassador. He calls you Israel. He calls you disciple. But more than anything, he calls you beloved child. And as we go on, we're going to talk about these different names, these different ways that God feels about us and thinks about us. Isn't that interesting to think of God as having emotion and God as having daily thoughts, that God is looking at you now and he's watching you, but he's watching you with adoration and and love, the same way that a mother or father would look at their child. I want you to know that you are loved. So today we're going to talk about some of these names. Now, if I've learned anything in my life, learned anything about myself, um, names have power. The names we give ourselves, the flags we fly, the names we give our places, names have deep meaning and power in our lives. Throughout my life, I have been called lots of names. I've had all sorts of nicknames. In fact, about 10 years ago, I was going through a name crisis because all of my nicknames started catching up with me. My first name that I was born with after my grandfather and father is Robert. This is a name I don't use very often. It's the one on my driver license from college behind me. That lets me with kind of long hair. I look like, uh, what's the tall, lanky guy from Scooby-Doo? Shaggy. shaggy. I look like Shaggy with, with straighter hair, maybe. Uh, yeah, Robert is the name that they call when I'm at the DMV or at the hospital. And it's an official name. You know, it's, a, it's a, this name. I don't go by Robert very often. When I was called Robert by... My parents, when I was a kid, it meant I was in trouble. And then, you know, as you get older, and I was a kid, you know, Bobby became my nickname. This is me, Bobby, when I turned 10. Same age as my daughter. Look at me, all tan. Loving California. Living the life. It was clearly a pool party. Uh, And Bobby is a name that I've had going back as long as I can remember. My dad, when I was a kid, went by Bob. He switched to Robert later, but... And so we carry that name. Like Bobby has a memory for me. And then later when I went to, to college, I switched to Robbie. I felt like it was a little more manly. My friends in hockey had called me Robbie on accident. I just sort of went with it. And so when I moved to a new state to go to college, I'm like, I'm Robbie now. Meet Robbie. And then I, I started dating this beautiful girl named Hannah who had a cousin named Robbie who she was close to and was uncomfortable kissing a guy named Robbie. It's like kissing your cousin. So she said, we got to find a new name for you. You can't keep going by Robbie. And for a brief time in history, you've probably forgotten this, Hannah, I went by another nickname for Robert that a lot of people don't know, Bo. Now, there are only a handful of people who called me Bo in my life, and it really didn't last. But there was friends of Hannah's that we went to visit in Albuquerque, and we just, like, tried it on. They didn't know any of our friends and, or anything, and we went out there, and she's like, this is my boyfriend. Were we married or dating at the time? I can't remember. I think we were just married, but I hadn't met them. And she says, this is my husband, Bo. And I was like, good afternoon, I am Bo. To this day, that couple, they still call me Bo. Did you, did you know that? I thought, well, at least, at least your husband does. And I still kind of like it. It has a good memory. Every time someone calls me Bo, I think of Albuquerque. I love you, Albuquerque. And when we moved back to California, I had forgotten that I had all these friends here and family who'd called me Bobby my whole life and refused to call me Robbie or Rob or Bo. And they were like, it's Bobby. So I was like, you know what? That's good. We're going back to Bobby. It's a true crisis. All jokes aside, we carry all those names for me have different. When someone calls me Robert, Robbie, Bobby, Bo, any of these things, they invoke memories and feelings of my past, of sort of who I was in the timeline of my life. Maybe you have some names like that in your life, and some of them are good memories. Maybe some of them are not great memories. When I was a kid, I also had other nicknames. 
I had a coach who called me Lionheart. That, even to this day, when I think about that, it means a lot to me, that he, he saw that personality trait in me. I met a girl named Hannah who started calling me Babe. I met a couple of kids who, to this day, still call me Daddy. These are all real names. So one day, people started calling me Pastor. And in fact, even to this day, every single Sunday morning of my life, there is a, a pastor of a humongous church in Texas. And every Sunday morning, this guy, with all this responsibility and influence, a ministry much bigger than mine, texts me, and his text always begins with the sentence, Bobby the Great. And it always finishes with, I love you and I'm proud of you. And I think about that, that name, Bobby the Great. What if I can embrace that name in my life? But you know, someone tells you enough times that you're great and that you're loved, you start to believe it. When I was a kid too, and even as an adult, I've had other nicknames too that weren't great. I had someone when I was a kid that called me expletive, S-head, all the time. I had uh, a guy that called me Scarface. I've had people call me a clown. I've had people call me an F-up and a loser. Maybe you've had people call you these types of names in your life. Somebody calls you a loser, an F-up enough times, you start to believe it. At the end of the day, the only name that matters is the one you believe in. You've had 10, 20, 30, 100 names that parents, friends, enemies, people at stores, people online have called you. And one of these days, some of these days, you look in the mirror and you embraced some of those names, the good ones, the bad ones. But this is important, that we understand that there are names we have that cannot be taken from us, that are given to us by God, that when we put faith in those things, we become them. We become them. We become the names that God puts on us, and very often we become the names that our enemies put on us. Don't listen to those names. I've told you this story before, but when I, when I was a teenager, we had a friend we played basketball with all the time, and his dad bought him 10 shares of Nike because he liked basketball, and he didn't really know anything about stocks. He was 16 at the time. And once we found out that he got 10 shares of Nike, we stopped calling, I don't even remember his real name. We called him Wall Street all the time. He was just Wall Street. That was his nickname for like two years in high school. And actually, when, when we met girls, we used to tell them that he owned Nike, which always went over really well. It was always a fun thing to do, and we always got a good response. Guess what Wall Street became? When he left high school, he went to college and graduate school and became an investment banker. To this day, I think about, I wish I could meet this guy again. I, I think it's, it's such a great analogy to what we do in our life. You know, so he just keep, keeps calling him Wall Street, Wall Street, Wall Street, Wall Street. His whole life, doesn't even know anything about finance, hates math and yet ends up being an investment banker because people have put this label on him. That can happen in a good way, but that can also happen in a bad way. My uncle, when he was a kid going to church, he had a youth pastor at this very strict holiness church who saw my uncle with long hair, thought that was a sin, didn't like that, even though my uncle's a pretty good person, and he called him Charlie Manson. This is a nickname he had, my Uncle Larry. Charlie Manson, Charlie Manson, Charlie Manson. And my uncle went through a, a very difficult time in his life, but came to this, you know, total conversion and fa faith in God. And he always, but he points back to that time where he's like, you know, when people saw Charlie Manson in me, it just made it so hard for me to believe I could do anything good for God, to believe that there was anything good about me. And it's so silly when you look back that that name was just about him having long hair instead of short hair. How much harm that youth pastor caused to my uncle. Names matter. God has names for you. One of these days when you get to heaven, God's going to call you a name. I think he'll call you by your first name, but I think he's going to call you something else. And that's the name that matters the most. I believe that when God sees you, you know, when you, well, God sees you now, but when you see God face to face in heaven, I just think there's going to be an incredible moment where he calls you something like beloved son, beloved daughter, and it's going to mean the world to you. 
And I think that so much of being a faithful disciple to Jesus is not waiting until we get to heaven to hear God call us by that name, but to now not only understand in our minds, but believe in our hearts, in our bones, that this is what God calls me now. This is what God calls you now. And to put your full faith and belief that God loves you so much, that God is cheering for you, that God has not given up on you, that God has great plans for your future, and that God intends for your future to be much better than your past, and to trust that he's not angry at you and judging you, but he's on your side rooting for you as a father or mother would root for their child. God is rooting for you and is on your side. He's with you. Amen. So what the Lord calls us in heaven, he's going to call us. He's calling us that now. And it's important that we understand that. It's interesting when you read the Bible, you see name changes all the time. And usually it's God doing the name change. God loves to change the name of places after important events happen there. God loves to change the names of people. Off the top of your head, you can probably think of a lot of Bible characters whose names were changed. Abram, which means exalted father, becomes Abraham, the father of many. Uh, Sariah, which means the princess of Yahweh, becomes Sarah, which actually means either princess or it means um, female minister. I'm not going to unpack that for you, but some other time it's preachable, though. Uh, Jacob becomes Israel. Daniel becomes Belshazzar. Jesus changes Shimon, which means the obedient one, Simon. He changes his name to Peter. But there's only one person in the Bible I can think of who God didn't change their name. They changed their own name. And he wrote most of the New Testament. His name is Paul. I love Paul's story. And I love how... Now, when we hear Saul to Paul, we think like Abram to Abraham. Like, it sounds the same. But in the original language, it doesn't sound anything alike. It's more like Daniel to Belshazzar. There is no connection in the original languages between Saul and Paul. Saul in Hebrew is Shaul. Everybody at home say Shaul. Let me hear you. It's all three of you guys. Thank you. He goes from Shaul to Paulus. They're not phonetically similar at all. So Shaul, this very Jewish boy. You know, we have some original sources that aren't in the Bible. And Paul's story is an amazing one. Paul's parents uh, were born in a a zealot city called Gashala. Zealots were, I don't don't want to go too far off here, but zealots were these these people in Jesus' day who were almost to the level of, I hate to say this, but like terrorists today. Militant theocrats who used violence, treachery, and things like that to try and engage in a type of guerrilla warfare to get occupiers out of Israel. And Paul's parents were like this. They were these zealots, both of them. His father was a Pharisee, and they grew up in this Gashala city, and they were a part of this major event called the Tax Revolt, which is a major issue for for the Romans. And during this time, uh, his parents were arrested, and, and as the Roman custom was, they were sold into slavery and were sold to a Roman citizen in the town of Tarsus. Now think about that just for a moment. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was born a slave, a literal slave. What do you think it's like to be a teenager in the Roman Empire and be a slave? Your owners can do anything they want with you, anything what what they want to you, any time they want, any way they want. You have no rights, you have no property, you have no freedom, you, you don't have anything. This is Paul. Paul grows up a Roman slave... His master maybe wasn't too bad because after Paul's master died, he manumated his parents, freed them. And when that happens in the Roman Empire, you go from slave status to freedman status and you're actually a Roman citizen. This is how Paul gets his, Shaul, I should say, Saul gets his, his freedom. And so Saul now is this, this guy and he, he becomes a Pharisee and he studies under Gamaliel. Gamaliel is considered one of the greatest one of the greatest rabbis in Judaism, to say that he studied under Gamaliel. Imagine you met an astrophysicist today, an old astrophysicist from Princeton, and he said, I studied under a guy named Albert Einstein. You'd think, that's pretty amazing. When Paul says, I was a disciple to Gamaliel, it's like the same impact in his day. He studied under 
maybe the greatest teaching rabbi in Judaism even today. Um, an important part of all sorts of rabbinic documents. But anyway, this is a... But, but Paul is... Gamaliel is, is kind of like Jesus in the sense that he taught his students to love their neighbor. Gamaliel said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself, quoting the Torah. And he even said that your neighbor was the Roman occupier. Now, I don't think Paul believed that. Paul studied under Gamaliel, but Paul seemed to struggle with this bitterness, this dislike for Gentiles. And you see it in his, his origin story, this like just... In fact, when he's on his way to Damascus, we know that Saul, or who becomes Paul, we know that Saul is persecuting the church. And one of the chur first churches he's going to, to to persecute is one in Damascus. Damascus was known for inviting Gentiles into this Jewish Christianity that is sort of blossoming. And we know that Saul sort of just hates this. And it's on that road to Damascus that Jesus knocks him off of his horse and covers his eyes in scales and says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Just a moment. Notice how Jesus, you know, Saul's never met Jesus, but Jesus says, you're persecuting me. Notice how he totally ties his own person to the church. Anyway, Saul has this amazing conversion experience, spends some time in Jerusalem, and then goes to Arabia to be trained. And then his first convert, and I just love this, he goes from, and this is Bobby talking, I think Saul the Jewish Pharisee, I believe Saul the Jewish Pharisee hated Gentiles. Saul the Jewish Pharisee hated Romans. He carried bitterness in his heart. He believed in this sort of, this sort of end of the world view that many Jews of the day had, that God was going to wipe out the Gentiles and only Jews would be left. I, th I think that that's what maybe Saul believed. And he goes from that to becoming maybe the most vocal supporter of Gentiles coming into the church and, and becoming God's people. In fact, his first convert is a man named Sergius Paulus. You might hear something in that name, huh? Sergius Paulus, who is a proconsul to Caesar. This is Paul's first convert, Sergius Paulus. Proconsul is like saying he was the secretary of state, maybe the number three, number four person in power, hugely influential. Saul goes to convert this guy. This is the first convert. Imagine you just come to faith and your first convert is, I don't know, some key member of, of the administration. I gotta avoid politics. I had all sorts of great jokes that I chose not to tell. Moving along. Sergius Paulus comes to faith and it is then that Shaul changes his name to Paul. Why did, he, why did he choose that name? Look, all these other Bible characters, God changes their names. You know, God, God changes their names to, to, to some new meaning. Do you know what Paul means in, in Greek? It means short. Short. And this adds to the fact that Paul himself was short and bald. And Paul chooses a name, short one. Why? Despite the pejorative nature of the name Paul, he picks Paul because it was his first convert. Paul decides to make the calling of his life his name. He chooses this name, Paulus, to remind him that the reason he is here on earth is because God forgave him and sent him to bring the Gentiles and even people of influence into the kingdom of God to be world changers. I think that Paul believed that that old way, that old pharisaical life of bitterness and anger and legalism and the harm that he did to so many people, he would never be that man again. He would be the man that Jesus made on the road to Damascus. He would become Paul. Although he's short and literal, he's a man of power, and his calling, his calling is the thing that drives him and the thing that makes him wake up in the morning. I am Paul. God has a name for you. Maybe when you look in the mirror and you see all the things you don't like about yourself, 
You remember all the stories of your life that you're really embarrassed about. You think of all the things you feel guilty about. All the ways you don't fit in. Or you're not like this person or that, that person. It's easy to embrace those really horrible negative names that others or maybe you yourself um, said to you. And I want to say to you that God has, has such an awesome name for you, as it says in Revelation, as Hannah read this morning. He says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, that's you. I will give some hidden manna. That means he's going to sustain you and nurture you. And I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. I want you to believe, as Paul said, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You are free. And I just want to speak over you the things that God thinks about you, that you are loved, that you are a conqueror, that you are great, that you are victorious, that you are the head and not the tail, that you are above and not beneath, that you are righteous in his name, that you are justified, that the path before you is good and not evil, that you walk by faith and not by sight, that you are a person of power, an influencer, full of light, full of love. You're a leader and people need people like you. And I'm so proud, so proud of you. I'm so happy for you because I know that so much good is coming in your life. You are so, so loved. I'll just finish with this. Every single week we say this creed and sometimes it's kind of hard to believe. We always say, I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. Man, the world says the exact opposite. You are, you are what you do. You are your stuff and you are your reputation. And we just, we just cast that idol down. In a time when you can't do anything, it's hard not to feel kind of worthless. There's very little we can do right now that's productive in the world's eyes, but there's a lot we can do that's productive for the kingdom, like pray and love our neighbor and grow deeper in our friendships and our relationships and commit our lives in ministry to God. Um, it's easy to think I am what I have, and most of us have lost a lot. We've lost a lot financially. We've lost a lot of progress that we've made in our careers or projects I know lots of people like here in L.A. who are gig workers and they had all these amazing things lined up that have just gone away. So it's, it's hard not to feel like, like those, things, those things do matter and they do matter to God. But it's hard not to feel like a part of your identity is gone because a lot of what you have is gone. In fact, most of us, the only thing we've gained during this time is the COVID-19. That is 19 pounds. That's what I've gained. No, but I, it's hard not to feel bummed and, and sad about, about what we've lost. And we, and we may have more physical things to lose, and that's also part of it. But remember, that, that is not, has nothing to do with God's love for you. That God loves to replace 10, 60, 100-fold what we've lost when we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. God loves to turn tragedy into triumph. He is someone that's going to change. He's going to turn the story around. You're in the middle of the book, not the end. And I just believe that, that if you are able to not be so... Like I, like I am, not, not get too worried about what you've lost. You're going to see God bring new things in your life. And of course, you're not what other people say about you. That is one saving grace about the coronavirus is we are all lazy together. So that's kind of nice. We all, you know, there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of judgment going around in terms of not being produced. But I am starting to see party lines being drawn for some reason, which I think is, is really not a good idea right now to get political. I, I'm starting to see that people are being really vicious to others. There's not a lot of grace. And I, I just want to say none of us have gone through this before. This is really hard for everybody. And everyone is going to respond in different ways. Pastor Ress said something like this earlier. It's just like a lot of us, are. some of us, are. we, we feel like we, got, have, we have to be angry, but we don't know who to be angry at. And I just want to encourage you that during this time... You, you relax, like, and, and you be careful, be careful not to give 
negative names to other people because you feel frustrated. Be careful. In fact, people need the kind of person you are, which is an encourager, the one who is putting good names on others. You put a good name on someone enough times, they're going to start to believe it. That's the power that your words have in your neighbor's life. When you begin to encourage your husband, encourage your wife, encourage your children, encourage your parents, encourage your neighbors, be short to anger, or be, yeah, be slow to anger, be, be quick to mercy and forgiveness, and compliment and help, and, and don't, be, don't feel like anybody owes you. During this time, the more gracious you can be, you'll be just like cool water to a thirsty person in the desert, to just be an encourager. You're, and that's who you are. You're such an encouraging person, and, and that's, that's who the world needs today. They need someone like you who's not going around judging and getting all angry, but somebody who's super encouraging, and I'm, I'm so grateful for you. Friends, we are all in this together alone, aren't we? That's kind of a way of thinking about it. We're all alone, but we're not alone. We're separate, but we're not divided. We're together, and I just so love that things like this have made available um, for us to gather as a church virtually, for us, for us to worship together as a church. And I do know that you miss this place, and we miss you so much, and can't wait to see you again soon. Remember, you are God's beloved. No one can take that from you. And I just believe this is going to be the best week so far for you during this, this uh, shelter in place. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you love us just as we are. And so, Lord, as children reaching up to their parents, we reach out to you and say, Lord, we open our hearts and our minds to your spirit. Thank you for the spirit of joy and life and love. We thank you. That's who you are, God, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.